practicing the discipline of silence today. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Now <laughs> That's what we'd say at the end. <laughs> After 45 minutes. Anyway, thanks for joining us today. Maybe that should be, maybe that should be our, because um, well, cause he always does the, the fun image of whatever we've talked about. So maybe it's you and me in a monastery, you know? Yeah, I like that. Or we could be like, we could be surrounded you know, by. The, the, the bald heads, the monk heads. The Both monk of us, heads. yeah. Yes. We could do that. Or maybe this is, well, it's, it, well, really, this is our post St. Paddy's Day celebration. Yeah, put us in green. Traditionally, um, the day after St. Patrick's Day, you're supposed to wear blue and gray, like, like uh, Pastor Barry and I have done today. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know that, it's because I just made it up. So March 18th, the day after St. Patrick's Day, yesterday was Sunday, as I recall. Yes, yesterday was Sunday. And uh, it was March 17th. Um, I don't know. When was St. Patrick's Day incorporated as a day? Do you know any of this? I, I don't. I should. I don't. Neither you nor I made any mention of St. Patrick's Day <laughs> yesterday. Mm -mm. Um, I didn't get any pushback from that. Do you, what, did no, anyone there was say, a lot of green, and I had someone say, like, oh, where's your green? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're like, and I, more confusing? What is more confusing? people in the choir to say, oh, you wore green today for St. Patrick's Day. And I looked at my dress, and I was like... Did I? Did I? Dress. So, dress. all right, do, do we need to talk about it? Because I, mean, I was going to talk more about St. Patty's Day, but we could also talk about the rods and cones in people's eyes and how people perceive it's, color differently. Because it's fascinating. But it did make me think. Joanne is just sad she didn't get to be on the show again. I am, I know. Can I just, will you consider? <laughs> I, I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I was, so I, I think that I have always thought that vision was like a true... Like it's this color, everybody sees that color. And right. That whole like black dress. Right. That's it. Yeah. That, 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 that meme years ago, the black dress but was the color. Yeah. it makes sense if people feel things differently and taste things differently and smell things differently, then they probably see things differently. Which right. Is just kind of mind blowing. To all me. of those things, like all of our senses together, are there, there's an element of subjectivity to them, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, people have tried to study that in the past. Like, are, P, are we actually seeing something completely different? Except there's some kind, there's a consistency in each one of our perceptions to the point where we're able to interact with one another, even though the way I see the world might be like, you might be seeing the world in like, and it looks like a film negative, but neither one of us no, has any idea of that because we're both, that's, that's, that's what our normal you is. Can't, you can't go that far. Yes. 1631, by the, by the Roman Catholic Church in 1631, <laughs> the which means in America was during the filming of The Fugitive in 1996, I believe. <laughs> Seven, a St. Patty's Day that? parade in 1730. Of course it was in Boston. Of course it was in Boston. Did you even need to say it was in Boston? Did you see that in Chicago they had the water green? Yes. Downtown? Yes. Yeah, um, they used to do that in Tampa sometimes, too. They make the water green. They make the beer green. <laughs> Not that I would know. And uh, but we we all we we reject St. Patrick's Day, right? We're Baptists. We're he Baptist. wasn't a Baptist, right? No, I'm baiting you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, he wasn't Baptist. He was way before Baptist. He was way before. <laughs> ah, there's the key, right? We can't be yeah. anachronistic. I actually had some interesting discussion with my kids about St. Patrick. Did you talk about St. Patrick's Day in your home at all? We did not. We should have, but no, we did not. We had a little, we, we, we um, my wife got uh, just a St. Patrick's Day book, and it's the one by Tommy DePola, that um, kid's author. He was one of my favorites when I was, when I was a kid. Um, but he told all of, like, the, the legends of St. Patrick. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's something about his fingers glowing at one point. There's that thing about him getting rid of all of the snakes, I think, mm -hmm. in Ireland, which, of course, these are all... Uh, legends. They even had another one. I'm not, this one might be true, uh, but it talks about how like he was trying to help people understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Hmm. So he picked up a three-leaf clover and he that? said, "Yes, this is one plant, but it has three unique. Mm -hmm. But they all make up one plant, they're not all, one. Yeah, they're one at the same time. You know, as analogies for the Trinity go, that's a lot better than other ones that I've heard." 
But uh, as you've explained to us before, you know, the Trinity, it's not, it's not one of those things really fully describable by yeah. the human mind. Yeah, we, we can't fully understand, but sometimes analogies can be helpful, but uh, in the end, they all fall short because what, no one is comparable to God or no analogy is compared to God, to comparable to, to God. But it can be helpful, especially in a, like in a mission context where someone has no concept of God. Totally. So, well, yeah. and that's who Patrick was, you know, yeah. one, of the, one of the most famous early missionaries mm -hmm. um, for sure. So, um, and I, that was a good conversation with the kids because they're talking about, well, are, all, are, are all these legends true? Did mm -hmm. this actually happen? And I said, well, no, but you have to remember that St. Patrick did exist, yes. well, st still exists. I believe he's in the courts of heaven as we speak. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, as time, actually, it was, I think the Spirit kind of gave me something helpful to say to the kids because as time goes on, these stories are told and retold. They grow into legends. People, yeah. they mix up details. They, um, I said it's similar to what's happened with St. Nicholas and becoming Santa Claus, who bears really no resemblance to the real St. Nicholas. I said, but that's what Joanna just learned that Saint, said, uh, uh, Santa Claus isn't real. Sorry about that, Joe. We'll talk about it later. But I said, that's what makes God's word um, so unique and so important. That's right. Because we believe it is unchanged. It's delivered to us now the same way that it was delivered to the, the men that originally wrote it down. Yeah. yeah. Um, we can trust that, that Christ is not simply a legend. Yeah, that's right. The Word is living and active. Which, I, so, and I want to talk, that's one of the things I want to talk about as we get into the message in a second. I don't want to get all the way there yet, but the difference between a legend and a historical event, because I think that we can have a helpful conversation around 2 Kings chapter 5. But before we get there, let me reintroduce Pastor Barry. He's the discipleship pastor here at Valleydale, Ch Valleydale Church. You brought the word to us yesterday. Why, why were you conscripted to bring the word to us yesterday, Pastor Barry? So our pastor is in Egypt and uh, is leading a team there. They are having a great time. And um, so in his absence, I was in um, Second Kings chapter 5, and uh, I don't know why I just felt led to go to that text. I just thought it was a fascinating story. Well, you've been, it seems like the Lord has taken you through a journey with uh, First and Second Kings, mm -hmm. you know, because there was a couple of years ago you were doing some things uh, yeah. with Elijah, talked to, you had a series on Elijah, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And then now this is Elisha, it's a little bit later on. So I, I don't know, I like that, I like that the Lord has, seems to, he seems to give you a fresh word um, going through these these narrative passages. You started with a story that I thought was really interesting, um, and I wanted to talk about it some, just while we're still here chewing the fat, is the um, the whole Sep Cuss mm -hmm. story, which, you know, apart from his uh, name sounding, um, I don't know, somewhat suggestive, the man is an excellent cyclist. Yeah, absolutely. So I looked this story up, yeah. Sep Cuss, um, what was the race that he won? It was the Spain. It was the Spain? Uh, Vuel Vuelta a España. Well, uh, so it's just like the it's like the Spanish version of the Tour de France. Yeah, Tour, Tour yeah, it's a huge race in September. So he ends up winning the race, but I didn't tell that part because it didn't didn't fit with the message. But he he um, is used to supporting everybody else, and all of a sudden he's in the lead. Yeah, and then he finds out, hey, these guys are supposed to be helping, me, but they're really opposing me. <laughs> This, it's a crazy story. He's supported yeah. these guys for years. And I think what happened is this was on Thursday when he when these guys just blew past him. So the race is over on Sunday. I think they started getting pressure from the media. Oh, from, they absolutely and, did. You know, like, hey, why, don't, why won't you let this guy win? So the other guys finally backed off, and he ends up winning. But I just thought – you don't you expect opposition from others, but not from your own team, and that's even in the Christian life. We, we, you know, we expect sometimes conflict with others, but not even within our own selves. And we, but that's the sin nature. It's in, as a Christian, we're in constant battle with the Holy Spirit. You know, we get blindsided a lot of the time. Yeah, we forget how sinful we are. Mm. We forget what's what's there. Um, yeah, really interesting story. As I was trying to, you know, I, I finally found the, the, the whole story. I think it might have been like NPR did a special on it, you know, famous conservative outlet NPR. And their whole, and but they went, as they went through the story, it was like, 
I, I realized how little I know about cycling. Because yeah. they were talking about, well, on this stage, they did such and such. And on this stage, well, he had the red jersey on. I'm like, I don't know what the red jersey is. But yeah. on this stage, he has the checked jersey. I'm like, what does that mean? And yeah. lots of foreign terms. Um, still very exciting, though. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and I don't know that much about cycling either. I just thought it's a, it's a really good story. And it brings to light the struggle that we all have as followers of Christ, that we still battle the flesh. It is a real battle. Um, so... Well, and I like how you bookended it because the story that you ended the message with was fascinating. I can't believe I'd never heard that before. Mm. Um, and, and you almost mentioned it in passing that this World War II general for the Germans, mm -hmm. it, was that true that he was basically second in command oh, yeah. only to Hitler? Yeah, he fought in World War I, then he worked his way up, and in the 1930s he became one of the higher officers. In fact, Remember the movie uh, Valkyrie? Yes, um, yes. Tom the, the attempted murder uh, assassination plot on Hitler. He was there with with Hitler and uh, helped him out. And I mean, he was he was his right hand man. In 19, I forgot to mention this in one of the services. In 1941, he personally signed the order that the Germans could could kill any Jew or civilian for any reason. Like he was personally wow. responsible for that and. So yes, by the 1940s he was he was called field marshal, but he was the second in command for the whole Nazi army, second only to Hitler. And he's there. He lived through to, through the end of the war, and he was yeah. one of those 21 really high-profile prisoners set to be tried at Nuremberg. Yes, and it, what I thought was interesting that his peers didn't like him. They just thought he's not really competent, but he was very loyal to Hitler, and. Um, but Hitler loved him. So anyway, um, yeah, he's there in Nuremberg with the 20 other war criminals, and they're just waiting trial. And here's a guy who had been a pastor in St. Louis who signed up. You think at age 50 he went into the military? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you showed his picture. That was really, that I was mean, really interesting. I mean, 50 years of age. So Henry I, Gorecki. Yes. Um, and I, I, read a, I was reading part of an article with, with his son, Chaplain Gorecki's son, and he was just talking about how his dad was so compassionate, how he loved people, but he could speak German, and that's why that he was an asset to the Allied, you know, forces there. So, what what a ministry! Can you imagine just praying and going into all these cells of these guys who have been responsible for killing so many people? So he goes into, and what's the guy's name? The uh, German yeah, guy's name? Wilhelm Keitel. Wilhelm Keitel. And he goes into his cell, and, and the Holy Spirit has already gone ahead of him. Yeah, Kaido's reading his Bible. and um, But was that a recent thing that had happened to him? He apparently had been a believer, but obviously had not been living like a, a follower of Christ. But he was under such conviction. Wow. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, the chaplain just couldn't believe it, but he just spent a lot of time with him. And then the, when the guy started praying, oh my goodness. He said, I, I never heard someone pray like that. What, do you know the outcome of the trial? Like what happened to Keitel at Nuremberg? I, I guess we can look that I don't, up. I'm not sure. I'd have to, Leah, I have to follow that up, but yeah. That would be just such an interesting exploration of God's justice in eternity yeah. versus man's justice here. Because the Bible's yeah. really clear that like, the, the, the way that this world is ordered, we are, we're able to see the temporal result of our actions. Yeah. Um, and that's important for us to see that. It points, to, yeah. it points to the eternal justice of God. Some of the, I read about a couple of the, not Keitel, but one or two of the other um, prisoners there, they committed suicide because they, they realized, hey, we're, we're either going to get executed or we're going to be in prison for life. So they went ahead and took their own lives. But the chaplain would, would not um, issue communion unless he was sure they were a believer. Um, in fact, one, one, of the, one of these guys, he just said, no, I'm not giving you communion. You know, and these, these were guys who were used to having all this power and authority. Wow. And then uh, now all of a sudden the chaplain's not giving you what you want. Uh, it was, I, I, I'm sure there's a book out there on him, but I would, I would love to read it more too. It's an interesting story. Kyle was sentenced to death and hanged in 1946. So he was, so he, he was given the death penalty penalty in here in uh, here in this life. Mm -hmm. But as far as we know, 
according to that chaplain, he inherited eternal life. There's some shades of the, the thief on the cross there. Yeah. Are there not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, very, very interesting um, story. I, I, so I, I liked the contrast there because you have there in Keitel someone who, um, by God's grace, um, the enemy from within was ultimately conquered. That's right. And uh, so you kind of have like, all right, facing the, facing the enemy within, and at the end, after talking about Gehazi, who obviously did not conquer the enemy from within, you're able to uh, you're able to see a modern uh, just some modern encouragement. Yeah, I was talking with one of our members afterwards, and she was saying this was it was an encouragement to remember that no one is too far gone spiritually. You know, you think of someone right. like Keitel, Naaman. Uh, you think, oh, there's no way. And so it, hopefully it's an encouragement for us not to give up, you know, praying for those family members. Even I was talking to one of our members yesterday, and he recently lost his mom. And he said she was, I think, 74. And uh, six months before she passed, she received Christ. You know, so she, her heart had been hard all these years. And, but he was talking about how peaceful her passing was. Yes. And uh, I was thinking about the verse, I think it's maybe Psalm 116, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His death loved of His ones. saints. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, it, it's a reminder for all of us. We all have people, whether it's a neighbor or someone, we think, oh, they'll never be come to Christ. Or it's a encouragement. Keep praying. You know, keep witnessing. Well, and to that point, as far as never being too far gone, you even made the argument that Gehazi was a believer. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, he was punished for his actions. Mm -hmm. But um, do, you, do you have any theory or thought of whether he inherited eternal life at the end? Yeah, I, I do believe he was a believer, but I, I, I can't prove it. We're not told. But you just think of someone that close to Elisha, you know, would Elisha have had an unbeliever as his servant, you know? Um, Good, yeah. I, I mean, we think probably not. But here, here's the surprising thing. Elisha had been the servant to Elijah, remember? So you wonder... Gehazi, maybe Elisha was setting him up to take over. Yeah. And you think all that Gehazi must have lost because of that. Yes. Um, I mean, we're not, we're not told there was a, you know, Gehazi took over for Elisha and got a double portion of his spirit and all, you know, all that Elisha yeah. received. Right. Um, so it, it, hopefully it's a sobering reminder that sin does have consequences. It does rob us of God's best. And, and, can you imagine having to have that conversation with your child, with your grandchild, like, Daddy messed up, you know, Daddy made a mistake, and now, you, you, you know, our, our whole line now is suffering from leprosy. That's some, that's, yeah, that's something that I wanted to think about, um, because there's so many just, like, um, fantastical elements of this story, mm -hmm. um, and, one, and one of them was even just the names, so Naaman... Does his name mean, did you say it was righteousness or uh, steadfastness? Gracious. Grace. So Naaman is gracious. Yeah. And Gehazi means greedy? Greed, yeah. Avaricious or greed, yeah. So I guess my question is, um, believing that this story actually happened, like is there mm -hmm. some kind of, is there any kind of editorial thing where they're, they're given different names in the telling of it? Like who would name their kid greedy? That's what I want to know. <laughs> so somebody mentioned that afterwards. They're like, why would you name your child greed, you know? Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know other than, um, you know, you just think what must have been going through Gehazi's mind as he's watching all this transpire between Elisha and Naaman, and he's, he's just he's yeah. furious, going, well, why won't you take it? Why yeah. won't you? And, um, <laughs> you know, and during, during that time, false prophets would often peddle people for money. Yeah. So Elisha, I think that's part of it. I didn't make that clear, but I think that's... Well, that's why we're talking now. That's part of why Elisha just said, like, I, I don't want to have anything to do with that. If it's going to appear like I'm making money off this, and I, I just don't want to receive anything. And then Gehazi says, no, hey, I'll, I'll, I will. <laughs> if you want, I'll, I'll be glad to take something. And so he goes after it. You just have to... Th thinking from Gehazi's perspective, it makes you wonder how many times has he witnessed a similar conversation take place? Mm. How many fantastical deeds, miraculous works was Elisha able to do? How many, how many hundreds of talents of silver had he turned down over the years? And finally, it broke Gehazi. This is um, like, I, I know that I've read this before, 
but that was very fresh to me when you had me read it this past week. Because the, um, the story that we're told in Sunday school growing up is all about Naaman. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that Gehazi's name was ever mentioned. Mm -hmm. And yet, that's just as important, if not a more important element mm -hmm. of this story. It's similar to how, you know, like growing up and understanding how for the churchgoer, the story of the prodigal son is yes. just as much about the older brother because yes. that might be the one that you identify with more in terms of your sin struggles. Um, and with Gehazi, that, that I, I, definitely, I, I can definitely identify with what he's going through there, maybe even more so than, than yeah, Naaman. And that's part of the day in which we live, the, the materialism, the things that we see, that we, we desire, and um, it's, a, it's a check for us to... What are we willing to give up to get those things? You know, what are we willing to, are we willing to de deceive like he did? Um, and you see how the greed led to lying. He lied to Naaman, he lied to Elisha. Yeah. And um, anyway, it was tragic for him. Um, I, I, it, was, it was a really helpful message, Pastor Barry. There were a few things along the way, like I had written down to ask you, and then you ended up answering them. I, I love the... I, I love that you gave us the context of where this falls in the history of mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about it's not 100% clear, but we're probably during the reign of Joram, mm -hmm. the king, you know, and he was the king in, was he the king in Israel or Judah? Israel. Yeah. And his contemporary was Ahab, is that right? I'm pretty sure that's, that was a couple chapters yeah. back. I might have missed something. Okay, yeah, Ahab. Yes, Ahab was Elijah, so I, I guess that would have been right before him. Oh, okay, so that was the yeah. same throne. All right. Yeah. I'm getting mixed up. I actually downloaded a chart. This is one thing I'm trying to learn. It's trying to learn all my kids. It gets confusing. Well, sometimes, sometimes the names are the same. Right? Oh. Like real, Joram or Jehoram. I either. know. <laughs> and I think there's multiple. Um, yeah, there's yeah, there's true. Then there's there's a couple where you get the first and the second, mm -hmm. but the text doesn't stipulate it's the second. Yeah. You have to look at, oh, it's the son of so-and-so. Okay, so you got to go back and put it. Uh, so that, that's tough. So I, I, I come back to that point with regards to who is the king uh, because that grounds it in time. Right. You know, I talked about how there's miraculous elements of this, but this is something that actually took place. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that was, was probably in the eight, 840s B.C. So um, Syria is a power. Syria is going to turn into Assyria, who, who is going to... Um, capture the northern kingdom of Israel, you know, 100 plus years later, then the Babylonians become the world power. Uh, it's, it's interesting how world history is so connected with biblical history. Yes. You know, that's what I'm sure our pastor is seeing right now over in Egypt. But Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing his findings when, when he comes back. He says he's going to give us a lot of that info on Good Friday. <laughs> One more, well, we can do a couple more points. Another, th another point of interest for me is how in terms, like, I guess in raw factual data, I thought it was interesting that Naaman was right about the purity of his rivers yes. versus the Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, you have these other rivers, they're coming, they're, you know, fed by maybe a mountain stream. Mm -hmm. They're probably clearer, mm -hmm. more drinkable, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. The Jordan River was kind of known for it being kind of a, I don't even know what to call it. Um, I get, brackish is not the right word because that would imply there's some salt in it. But it's just kind of yucky. Yeah. You know, it's not clear. Yeah. But that was, the, that was the river of God's promised land, mm -hmm. and that was the means that it used. Yeah, so Mount Hermon, and there's one other mount. I think it's Mount Ominous. Those would have fed the rivers of Damascus. So, yeah, I mean, he was right. From a, but it wasn't just about the water, you know. It was, it was about obedience to, to the word of God. And um, that's how faith has always been. You think of Abraham, he obeyed God. You know, Hebrews says he obeyed God even though he doesn't, didn't know where he was going. Can you imagine that? You imagine like going home and telling Lauren today, God's leading us, where are we going? I don't, us, I don't know. Going to land of us. <laughs> We're just going, you know. I guess you could make a Christological connection there too. Like the Jordan River, he looks at that, what's so special about this? You know, the God's word says about the man, Jesus Christ, that you need to look at him, there wasn't anything particularly special to see. Yes. But you had to trust that this was God's anointed. Yeah. Naaman had to trust that this was God's anointed water, mm -hmm. even though it didn't look like it. Yeah. And thankfully, he had, some, he had some great servants around him 
you know? That was another really that good point, that, that he listened to them. He listened to the servant girl, mm -hmm. and he listened to these ser So, like, there was, there's clearly something going on. Like, obviously, he was a man of great accomplishment, mm -hmm. probably well-born, mm -hmm. you know, great but there was something in, there was a humility or an openness to him that he yeah. would even communicate with the servants that way. Yeah, I wonder, and we're not told, you wonder if it's his military background, you know, he's used to receiving input from others, and I don't know, but he listens to the slave girl, and um, she was, to me, one of the bright spots of the whole thing. You yeah. Know, she's, she's not filled with anger, with bitterness, but with compassion, and that's a word for us when things aren't going our way, when we're not in a situation we want to be in, but we can still be filled with the love of God. And there's still people around us that we can, you know, we can point, hey, if you could go over here, man, God could really work in your life. And that's exactly what she does, and, and he listens. Well, let's end by talking about the level of her compassion. Mm. Because there's a good, so she was displaced <clears throat> from her people. Um, yeah. probably because those close to her were killed. Mm -hmm. And there's a good chance that they were killed under orders from Naaman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you think the trauma of that, you think about um, the dreams she had. Maybe she, you know, I'm going to grow up and do this, and I'm going to get married, and I'm going to have children, um, not being able to see her parents again. You know, all of those things, uh, certainly traumatic. But in the midst of that, she, she, had, she had faith, which many in Israel did not mm. at that time. And then she had compassion yeah. for, for the man who was responsible for all of, all of that tragedy in her life. Or at least ultimately responsible. It's pretty wild. And then, um, and then you have Naaman's wife who passed that along. I mean, she could have dismissed it and said, oh, mm. you don't know what you're talking about. But she passed that along to her husband. He listens. It's just a fascinating story. I told Courtney last week, I said, I hope I can just do this chapter justice you know like it was, it's such an interesting story but that's why we just have to go to the word of god and trust the holy spirit's gonna he's gonna speak he's gonna direct us well there's so, so much there's so much that we can learn from it but thankfully you you ended by uh, reminding us of the most important thing and that's that our faith must be found in christ yeah. so thank you again brother for that helpful message and um we're uh, so now we're moving forward we've got pastor coming back this week as I understand it, he's returning to Ephesians, and then I think he'll take a break for a holy weekend with Good Friday and, and then Easter Sunday. Wow, it's really, it's, it's Less coming than two up. two weeks, yeah. It is coming up. Yeah. Uh, what, how's things, how things been going on Wednesday night with the Joshua study? Oh, great, great. We were in, um, <clears throat> see, we've worked all the way through Joshua 5, so this week, uh, Pastor Patrick will be leading us on the fall of the Wall of Jericho. That's going to be chapter cool to Chapter 6. Uh, what a great chapter, so... Yeah, it's been great so far, and we've had really good discussion in there, and um, I think the people seem to be enjoying it. Josh, you know, we're doing 24 chapters in nine weeks, so it's kind of a... That's quick. It's, it's a lot in a short amount of time, but uh, that's one of the... Joshua is a, it's a hopeful book. It's a book of, you think of, they've waited all this time, and now they get to occupy the land. And so, um, yeah, it's been a great study so, so far. So many fascinating things, and it just so happens that I'm, that's what I'm reading uh, at the supper table with my kids is Joshua. Mm. So many th It's always so helpful to go back through. So many things i would forgotten about, being reminded about how God's calling them to be um, consecrated, and then the new generation is circumcised, mm -hmm. and then they go, and of course, that miracle there at uh, Jericho, you know, I didn't mention this yesterday, but you have, you know, Naaman's a Gentile that gets saved. Well, so was Rahab. Exactly. You know, yeah. I mean, way earlier, but that's that was her story in chapter two. You know, she said, "Didn't I, our hearts have been melted? Our hearts have melted when we heard of what God did." Mm -hmm. And you know, one question I thought of as I worked through that: Why didn't the other residents of Jericho get saved? Great question. I mean, they all must have heard the same thing, but her heart was soft, and she responded in faith. Um, and, you know, why didn't more people in Israel get saved? Yeah. Then Naaman gets saved. You know, it's just it's more people than Noah. Why? You know, more people than Lot. That's it's just um, yeah. That's that's the the mysteries of God. I guess we'll just have to leave it there. So should the Lord tarry, we're going to see you on Wednesday, and then again this coming Sunday. Pray for Pastor as he uh, as he comes back. Uh, Joanna, anything else we need to tell people? The RSVPs, the RSVPs for Good Friday. For Good Friday. Yes. It's closing on Thursday. At noon. 
For the sake of clarity, we should say that even if you don't reserve a meal, you can, of course, come to the service. Mm -hmm. But if you want a meal, got to do so by Thursday. Uh, that's everything. It's been fun spending this time with you, Pastor Barry, and with you, our friends who are watching the sermon recap. We'll see you later. Pastor Barry and I are now going to continue with 45 minutes of meditation. Of silence, yes. <laughs>